You can't heal under a mask, Angela. Wounds need air. Hi, I'm Craig Mazin, and this is the official Watchmen podcast. And much like Sister Knight's practical family car, as it fell from the heavens, I have returned. And I'm here today to talk about the multiple Emmy-nominated show Watchmen. And to do so, I am joined today, as always, by executive producer and writer Damon Lindelof, but will also be joined by two of the key directors of the show, Nikki Cassell and Stephen Williams. We're going to start off, of course, with Damon. And since we last spoke, well, the world's changed a bit. These days, our faces are hidden. There is civil unrest. Titans of technology continue to shape our existence in ways we don't understand. It seems, Damon, like Watchmen was as much a warning as a television show. It's good to see you again on a screen. Um, (laughs) The the magic is different. Separated by COVID. For sure. It has been strange. I mean, the virus is something that no one saw coming, and I don't think anyone could have predicted it. But I think that there are other elements of the show, particularly as it relates to the questions surrounding law enforcement, racial injustice, and this reckoning. I don't think this show predicted any of that. In fact, I saw Yaya giving an interview. They asked him if he thought that the show was predictive. And he said, I don't know, maybe it came a couple decades too late. Yeah, It's all a matter of perspective. But I sort of, I feel like there have been no shortage of incredible writers and intellectuals and artists who have been saying we need to be talking about these things for quite some time. And Watchmen was a part of that conversation. And I think it's the kind of last thing that was talking very specifically about some of these ideas before we found ourselves in the midst of a simultaneous pandemic and an awakening, a reckoning. Uh, It's great that the traditional frivolity of talking about a television show is now we also get to talk about the world around us because that's really what we were attempting to do. Well, the show does lend itself to being an extensible analogy. I mean, it really can be taken in all sorts of different ways to apply to all sorts of different topics that are relevant to our lives now. And one of the things that you delve into pretty deeply from the jump is the Tulsa Massacre. June 1st was the 99th anniversary of the Tulsa Massacre, and you could argue that it took 98 years to get uh, its historical due. And that is, in fact, because of your show. It is somewhat intimidating now to wade into creative story waters that touch upon race in our country and the way we struggle as a nation and as a people to be just and fair to each other and specifically to people of color. But it seems like your show succeeded in part simply by being honest brokers about a difficult topic. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how Watchmen might be a model for art and even for non-artistic discourse about race in our country? That's, um, That's an incredibly intimidating question. And I think what I'd say is we didn't set out to educate, but at the same time, we acknowledged that There's this incredibly powerful delivery mechanism in popular culture, and particularly when you ask, what is the culture really interested in at this moment in time when we were writing the show in 2018, 2019, is this sort of fascination and fixation with superheroes. The hardest thing I think to do in storytelling is to get someone's attention. Mm. We already had their attention Mm -hmm. because people are like, I'm interested in superheroes. So I was thinking from a point of view of like, if we can put something familiar, like the word Watchmen on a poster, and then we put Regina King, who's also familiar and incredible, and we put her in a superhero garb, guys, people will lean forwards. And then now that you've got their attention, what are you going to say? And say it quickly, because you might only have their attention for the first 10 minutes of the pilot, but hopefully you can hook them in. And and to that end, I just feel like 
the reason that the Tulsa massacre was erased so easily is because it not only wasn't reported in the, our legitimate news channels, right. it hasn't been woven into our popular culture either. And I think when you look at what happened with Juneteenth, for example, as well, but I became aware of Juneteenth on an episode of Blackish, you know, mm-hmm. uh, which I saw for the first time like three years ago. It's just a, a sitcom on ABC that my son actually turned my wife and I on to and we love, but it's sort of like, it shouldn't be on Blackish to teach me what Juneteenth is. And the only reason I had a functioning knowledge of it is because of that piece of popular culture. But I do feel like, is it popular culture's responsibility to educate? No, but we should always be asking ourselves, a lot of people are using these movies and TV shows that are fictional Mm -hmm. as a foundation of of what turns them on or what they're interested in or what they're exposed to. You have to take that into account when you're doing something and say, I have a real opportunity here. Why not take it? Right. I mean, you essentially can serve as a history professor that people will pay attention to. I want to be that nerdy history teacher in high school who comes in like dressed up in colonial garb. I had sure. that teacher. His name was Mr. Roma. Mr. Roma, if you're still out there, Watchmen is your fault. I'll always remember that guy because he dressed up as, as different historical figures. <laughs> right. um, and it, it was the same lesson. But I do think like, unfortunately, we live in a world where you have to make the presentation of the history interesting enough to capture people's imagination and their attention. Well, as the showrunner, you are responsible ultimately for carrying your intentions through to the impact on the audience. I'm wondering if you can talk about how things worked out relative to the way you thought they would work out now that you've had some time to see how culture has absorbed these nine episodes of television. Well, I'm trying to think back to what it was like in the time that we were making the show. I was absolutely and totally convinced that the show was going to be a disaster and that it was not working. The one exception was the actors are really good and the directors Mm -hmm. are doing a great job. But like if I were to synthesize just that general anxiety, I was feeling like the show was too earnest and that it was on a soapbox or that I wasn't trusting the audience to understand what we were trying to say. It felt maybe a little bit too much like a finger wagging as Mm -hmm. opposed to a piece of popular entertainment. And more importantly, and this is just true, it wasn't my story to tell. And the deeper into the story that we got, the more I realized that and was like, how in God's name are you writing this stuff? Like, you just don't know what you're doing. And the more that I would stop and then rely on my collaborators to say, we got this. Mm -hmm. That was the moment where I started to go, oh, this isn't even mine anymore. And so like this idea of, I don't want it to feel performative because a part of it is performative. This conversation that we're having now where I'm saying I'm a white man who has all the benefits of being a white man. And then while I'm at it, I feel so compelled to make this story about race. And so in the process of making the show, I want it to feel authentic and not performative. I didn't want it to feel like it was SJW propaganda or that I was trying to politicize Watchmen, even though it was a deeply political text. And so this idea of getting comfortable with the contradictions and sort of understanding coming into my role as an SJW, which by the way, the first time someone called me that, I thought it was single Jewish white. Yeah, I'm like, I am that. I don't understand that. They're like, no, it's social justice warrior. And I was like, oh, is that a derogative thing? Right. Like I kind of, I want to be a social justice warrior, right? And it's like, no, you don't. Yeah. We've spoken about this on the podcast before, but now with the amount of time that's gone by, I guess I would phrase it like this. You don't have to say, oh yeah, you know what? Maybe, sure. Yeah. You know what? There will be more Watchmen. But are you still saying there definitely won't be from you? My thinking hasn't really changed, but here's what I'll say is I think about this world all the time. And and even though my part of the storytelling ended with Angela's foot 
about to make contact with the surface of that pool, my romance with Watchmen continues. Mm -hmm. I'm still really in love with it. If it's a decade from now and Regina and I are sitting around and suddenly the idea comes Mm -hmm. and I go like, oh God, there it is. I know what the next chapter should be. I don't want to close that door completely, but I don't want to leave it ajar either. And I still stand by the thing that excites me most is for Watchmen to continue under a different visionary, a different creative stewardship, because I feel like this material more than most lends itself to that. And who doesn't want to see a season of True Detective run by Phoebe Waller-Bridge? And just what would that look like? And what would that feel like, you know, inside of that franchise? And I feel like I was definitely a part of the storytelling of Watchmen. The the minute that it stopped being mine, I think, is the moment that it started working. And I just want to follow that instinct, which is, you know, you can actually get further off the stage than you already were. (laughs) And I will say that it's not a Wonka test in terms of like, who's going to run the factory now. But the more I say, hey, Watchmen is yours, it's out there for the taking, I have to imagine that people are already ideating on this idea Mm -hmm. of like, I can do a season of Watchmen two years from now to drive by a billboard on Sunset Boulevard and see the word Watchmen in that font and have had nothing to do with it. I can't imagine how exciting that would be. Well, it is perhaps the highest compliment I can pay you that the thought of trying to follow in your footsteps and in the footsteps of your writing staff and your directing team is terrifying, (laughs) absolutely terrifying, considering the quality and the reach and impact of this show. Thank you, Damon. Thank you. Up next, I sit down with Emmy-nominated directors Nicole Cassell and Stephen Williams. Nicole has been a director on The Leftovers, Vinyl, and Westworld. She is an executive producer on Watchmen and directed the episodes It's Summer and We're Running Out of Ice, Martial Feats of Comanche Horsemanship, and A God Walks Into a Bar. Steven was a regular director and co-executive producer on Lost. He is an executive producer as well on Watchmen and directed episodes She Was Killed by Space Junk and This Extraordinary Being. Let's get into the conversation. Nicole and Steven, welcome. Thank you. How are you? Great. This is a much easier task for me than it is for you because I get to be a fan and ask all the fan type questions. And so when you both approached this series, it was pretty clear that you were going to create a new visual language for Watchmen. It was going to be influenced by what we understood the world of Watchmen was based on a graphic novel. And yet it would also be quite different. How did you create what I would call an impressively unified visual language for a series that takes place over nine episodes directed by many, many different people and multiple episodes by each of you? How did you make it all work so seamlessly? First of all, and this is not just blowing hot air at Damon, but it truly does start with the script. You read this story and it holds together because you are so driven by the narrative, even though you're flying through different genres, different planets, that's what holds it together. So the first thing I said to Damon when I read the script was, I feel like I've just read the visual version of the song Bohemian Rhapsody, Mm. where you have all these genres put together that if one were to describe would make no sense and would most likely be laughed at. But somehow it comes together so compellingly that you're just catapulted through this journey. And at the end, your head's kind of spinning, but it held you because the narrative is so strong. And when I read the script for the pilot, I had not read Watchmen. Mm, Interesting. I had bought it when I heard that Damon was working on it but never actually read it. And before talking to Damon, I then opened up the book and and leafed through it, just looking at it. What immediately struck me was the vertical format of the panels rather than the more conventional horizontal. So tell me, why does that grab you? Because it's unconventional. And Mm. then it throws a challenge at us of how to pay a homage to the source through a vertical frame, it said to me, okay, let's shoot through things as often as possible. 
very much inspired by Wong Kar Wai and the conformist. The vertical was just another challenge to us of like, okay, how can we create a vertical within our horizontal? And that I was looking to give Easter eggs to the viewers that might not have been written into the story. You know, Damon was taking care of the master plot Easter eggs, but in creating the pilot, I assembled a world book that had the rules for this universe any little detail, we created a whole book of information for the whole crew to read. And we gave everyone the mission of look for Easter eggs to put in frame. Oh, this became sort of a crowdsourced topic because I was wondering, there's so many, how you were able to get them all in there. So you enlist everybody in this task. Absolutely. We'd arrive on set and the set dressers had put little owls here or clocks there. <laughs> this is great. I get it now. You, you kind of turned the army loose on that one. But you're also handling this other aspect of the show that is unique to Watchmen in, in a number of ways. There's this concept of mystery as opposed to confusion. Mystery good, confusion bad. Watchmen walks that line about as craftily as any show I've ever seen. So how, as a director, do you approach this notion of, I need you to be lost and yet not despairing as an audience member? How do you keep them engaged while you're messing with their heads? You know, fortunately, I have had prior experience with this visual sleight of hand vernacular, having worked with Damon in a previous iteration on a show called Lost, which very much trafficked in this selective doling out of information that you have just articulated. So exactly as Nikki said, it all starts with the page and it starts with, you know, Damon's posture in terms of viewers and the audience. He trusts that the viewers will be engaged and will understand that they are being led somewhere purposefully and that that investment in time and interest will eventually pay off. So once we start peeling back the layers of the script and trying to render that text visually, and most times it's anchored in a specific character's point of view. Which is a a major aspect of directing in and of itself is the choice of perspective. You have a number of protagonists. Everybody would say, okay, Regina's character is the protagonist, but you also have multiple other heroes that you're following. And as you're going through those scenes, particularly when they start sharing scenes, um, how do you make choices about how to balance your perspective? For instance, there's a wonderful scene where Jean Smart's character has a conversation with Regina King's character. It's right after a funeral has gone wildly wrong. I was at the crime scene earlier, and you know what I saw? Tire tracks right at the base of the tree. What kind of vehicle? I'm sorry, did I say vehicle? No, no, no. No, um, it was a wheelchair. And I'm just curious how you approach perspective as a director when you've got two powerhouses like that, both of whom are incredible actors, both of whom are in charge of the story that they're in, and yet now they are kind of opposed to each other. That scene you're describing occurs in episode three, which which I directed. In terms of the nuts and bolts of the scene, the scene is about Gene Smart endeavoring to ferret out information that can be useful to her. But Regina's job in the scene is to be as cagey and as right. unresponsive and as opaque as possible. From a purely kind of pedestrian directing point of view, you have actors. Actors remain the most sublime special effect of our craft. And when you have Gene Smart and Regina King in a scene, you just have to do very little except remind yourself to stay out of their way. I mean, that is very humbly stated, but it seems to me so much of what you do is occupy the headspace of all these different characters at once. What they are feeling and thinking and wanting in the middle of a moment And I want to talk about the thing that people are generally uncomfortable talking about, especially these days. It seems that there's a lot of tentativity around the topic of who gets to tell what story. And what's interesting about Watchmen is not only is every director being required to tell stories about people that are different races and different genders from them. And because so much of Watchmen is about identity, 
race, how identity and race connects to our sense of who we are as Americans. I'm curious if your own identities felt relevant and important to the stories you were telling and either way, how you connected that to the moments where you were telling parts of the story that were not connected to your own identity of who you are. Part of what made me so passionate and fight so hard to get this job, not I don't know how hard a fight it was, but I put my everything into getting it was because I actually connected to it deeply personally. And that may sound surprising now looking at it, but I, like many citizens of this country, was reeling from the election of 2016. I'm from Charlottesville, Virginia, Mm -hmm. and had this political storm inside of like, what can I do? And how can I be politically active in this time? And this script came and it was like the answer to where could I pour all of that energy? And then during the course of making it, our friend Damon was the one who I first started really hearing this, these words, it's not my story to tell. And at first, uh, I'm going to just be totally honest, at first I was, um, I want to say impatient with that concept because my entire life I've been fed material told by people who weren't to tell that story. Mm-hmm. You know, it was all white men making those movies, whether it was Terms of Endearment or Kramer versus Kramer, like just Sophie's Choice. You know, one group of people made all the stories. And it was like, I'm finally getting my shot to work. <laughs> and now I have to filter that <laughs> when I'm finally getting right. a chance. But I understand it 100%. And so it's kind of a long-winded way to say I, I did feel this was my story. And maybe because I'm not Black, taking on telling Tulsa 21 was that much more terrifying, mm-hmm. but in a way that only could motivate me to do my very, very, very best to serve it correctly. Beautifully put. Stephen, what do you think about this? Uh First of all, I would have to say that I think that the debate about who can tell what stories is a legitimate one. And often it's kind of articulated in an imperfect way, which is to say that often the underpinnings of the debate have to do with access to the Mm -hmm. opportunity to tell stories. The notion of someone from outside a specific gender or racial group telling a story about a gender that isn't their own or a racial group that isn't their own revolves around who has historically and up to and including the present moment had the opportunity and access to tell that story. Right. I think that's like ultimately the crux of what that debate really is about. And it's legitimate and it's meet and right. And it is a debate that does not offer immediate clarity, but nonetheless should be pursued with zeal, right? Personally, in terms of Watchmen, I just brought my own personal kind of experience as a black man who has now been living in America for 16 years. Where were you from before this? I was born in Jamaica. I went to high school and university in England, and mm. then I lived in Toronto for well, years. That explains the and... 12 accents you have in one accent. <laughs> <laughs> but yet, the experience of being a black man in the countries that I have specified, even including Jamaica, which has its own kind of complicated post-colonial history, the experience of being a black man has been more or less operating within the same bandwidth of Mm. discriminatory superstructure that gives rise to diminished access to justice and to fairness. And so certainly in terms of episode six. And of course, episode six is the one where Angela takes all of Will's nostalgia pills and journeys through his mind and his memories and goes back in time to uh, the moment when he was hooded justice. Exactly. It was territory that I felt intimately connected to and with in a number of ways. So it felt organic to be walking in the footsteps of those characters. And I think you make a great point about access 
and that being the important context for this question, because it does come up from time to time. And I think some people rightly think, well, part of what art is, is one person's ability to sort of take the human experience, empathize, feel other people's positions, and then recreate something, which is all true. But the freedom to do that probably doesn't feel good until everybody has a chance to do it. Exactly. Let's funnel a little bit further then into the relevance of the story. You said something there, Stephen, that really struck me as quite true about Watchmen, that your experience in over time and in different countries was robustly the same, a discriminatory point of view against black people, regardless of where you are. There is something remarkable, though, I think that you all achieved in a country that seemingly has this endless conversation about race that doesn't ever go anywhere. You introduced and visualized for people in this incredibly important way something that most Americans simply didn't know about, and that is the destruction of Black Wall Street, Tulsa, 1921. Can you talk about the impact this show has had, not just on Black Americans seeing that recreated and made clear and true to them, but also white Americans? Well, the first night the show aired, there were over 500,000 Google searches for Tulsa 21. And it's people saying, did that really happen? And there was this feeling of, if nothing else came of the show, just that made it worth it. You know, and, and afterwards to get people calling or emailing or on Instagram asking, you know, how did you learn about it? What can I read? And sharing what I had read. But, you know, and working backwards, I learned about it from the screenplay. And I'd say 95% of us in production learned about it that way. And then others were, you know, we had someone there who was a, a descendant of somebody mm. who had survived. Stephen, do you feel like your work on this show and the show as a whole has made a difference? I don't know how to honestly answer that question, but I will try to answer it this way. In Jamaica, we have this expression, a folk expression, that basically goes, what about the half that's never been told? Mm -hmm. So Watchmen, for me, locates itself in the lineage of trying to redress the imbalance in the larger narrative about not just this country's history, but the history of a vast portion of the world that has been engaged in and impacted by the processes of slavery, colonialism, Jim Crow, that whole unholy stew of yeah. social injustice. So Tulsa, as important as it is, the massacre of Tulsa 1921, is only one of many, many things right. that have been buried, in some cases deliberately, in some cases, simply by negligence, by contempt in terms of a refusal or an inability to value other people, Native Americans, Africans brought here to work as free labor for hundreds of years, but also women, the contribution of women to the larger narrative, all of those aspects of a fuller and more truthful and more honest national narrative is part of the work that Watchmen is endeavoring to do. It's not that hard. Take Thomas Jefferson. It's not hard to make the sentence. Thomas Jefferson was an architect of the Declaration of Independence while concurrently owning slaves and yep. being the father of at least six offspring who remained enslaved, even yep. as he was crafting that document that is considered a, a hallowed part of this country's past and history. I just think we should teach both those things. I personally believe that human beings are for the most part capable of containing both of those truths in their consciousness. And we just have to make sure that they have access to that. How successful we were, I don't know. <laughs> But I know that it's a, a worthwhile endeavor and certainly part of the work that I hope to do for the rest of my career and, and life. 
I know that not only was the show successful in the standard perspective of a network like HBO in terms of people watching and talking, but it was also successful in making an impact. It does seem to me that Watchmen sets a tone and a standard that others are going to want to meet. And it also shows that there is an appetite. Well, I have a thought to add to that. Yeah, please. And it connects to your question of whose story do we get to tell? And what you're saying is we affected people. And as directors, I think Stephen would agree, every single actor on the screen, we need to sit in their shoes and know what they're feeling and thinking, as you said. And what we're hoping to do by doing that is to put it in people's televisions in their homes and lead them to feel those things. So it is about empathy and asking people to feel for or consider people outside of their maybe direct point of view. And if we've done that, that's the ultimate goal. And just even getting these different faces into these households is an achievement. Well, that's beautifully put. And I'd like to just say that the two of you are also a great beacon of hope for all of the, let's just say, non-white guy directors out there who are looking to break into this business because Nikki, as you pointed out for so long, the only people telling stories were white men. And it is great to see people like you working on the level you're working, which is at the very, very top. So thank you for talking with us about Watchmen. Your work speaks for itself, but I must say that the two of you speak for yourselves just as eloquently. And I learned a lot, so thank you. Thank Thank you you. so much. Well, that was a fantastic conversation. Thank you to all the folks who agreed to show up today. Thank you to Damon, thank you to Steven, and thank you to Nikki. And a reminder to you at home, you can still stream Watchmen, of course, on HBO and HBO Max. And we're going to be back again with another episode talking to some of the writers who made the universe from the graphic novel their own. This podcast is produced by HBO and Pineapple Street Studios. Please subscribe, rate, and review. And you can listen to this on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Thanks. Thanks.